So Cramorant, I mean, what's not to love about this most excellent of waterfowl? <coughs> ah, clearly one of Galar's greatest charmers. They've got fashionable attire. They've got, um, beautiful eyes? Eh. Okay, look, this Pokemon is by no means the most attractive, but it is pretty. Pretty close to its real-life inspiration. Its name is sort of a literal translation of sorts of a cormorant who loves to cram food down its gullet. Uh, this theme is reflected within its Japanese name as well, being a combination of ooh, an onomatopoeia for the sound of choking, and cormorant, which is also pronounced ooh. Ooh, 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 ooh. Uh, we'll get to that choking part in a minute, but a cormorant is a shorebird found pretty much everywhere on the planet besides Antarctica. And there are over 40 species across the globe, but the UK, the real-life region that Galar is based on, is home to two of these, the Great Cormorant and the European Shag. Love me one of those. Cramorant takes most of its design elements from the latter, but hold on! Sure, the Shag shares a general body shape with Cramorant, but so does the Great Cormorant, or really any Cormorant for that matter. So what makes the Shag so special? Well, if we keep comparing it to this Shag, you'd be right, but this one! Oh yeah! That's much closer. In nature, animals will generally change their behavior and appearance during the breeding season in a phenomenon known as courtship display. For some animals, this entails odd ritualistic behaviors by the males of a species to woo a mate, a practice common in most of the animal kingdom, but especially prevalent in birds. I mean, look at these. Holy beans. So that other shag was a non-breeding male, but this handsome fella, just raring to go. Take note of the crest atop its head, the striking green eyes. They're an exact match to Cramorant. That's right, Cramorant gets around year round. Let me smash, please. No, Ron, I am a Pikachu. And while the breeding shag's body feathers are black with a green tint, since this waterfowl is most often seen by, well, water, the metallic sheen the feathers have make it appear blue under the right circumstances. So it's not just blue because it's a water type Pokemon, it's blue because sometimes cormorants appear blue! Now, I did say that the European Shag accounts for most of Cramorant's design, but the Great Cormorant isn't completely overlooked. The feet and tail seem to be closer in design, but really most cormorants are the same. But what makes the Pokémon more unique is the triangular shape and two tufts sticking out of the back. It makes the Mon look like it's wearing a bib, often worn by cartoon characters to symbolize incredible lust, I mean hunger, which really is just lust for food, is it not? And in its case, it may resemble one of those plastic bibs seen at lobster bakes, which are fairly popular for seafood lovers in England. And also, cormorants love fish. It makes up most of their diet, though if given the opportunity, they won't pass up on a good crustacean either. But other than a bib, it also resembles juveniles or first-year molts, as they haven't grown into their adult feathers quite yet. They have a light-colored breast, which somewhat resembles a bib already. They really just didn't miss any stops with this design, did they? I mean, like, sure, it's pretty simple to just take aspects from source material, but no matter how you look at it, every part of this Pokémon has some reason for it being there. Well, almost everything. I have no idea what this white dot? is doing here. I actually never noticed it until now, and I'm not alone. A lot of official Cramorant art is missing this detail as well. The trading card game, Pokemon Unite, it, it, it just seems so pointless to have it if it's not super important to Cormorants themselves. But now how about its dex entries? Its sword Pokedex entry says, It's so strong that it can knock out some opponents in a single hit, but it also may forget what it's battling mid-fight. Cramorant's gluttony led it to try to swallow an Aerocuda whole. 
which in turn led to Cramorant getting an Aerocuda stuck in its throat. Occasionally, it makes a mistake and tries to swallow a Pokemon other than its preferred prey. Oh no, it's dumb! Now, you'd assume that Cormorants may be more closely related to ducks or pelicans. I mean, they are waterfowl, and they do look very close after all, and have similar eating habits, but that's not the case. They're closer in blood to garnets and boobies. And not just the blue-footed variety either. This is a family of famously ditzy, scatterbrained avifauna whose stupidity knows no bounds. All three have the whole dazed out blank expressions going on, which is very likely why Cramorant always looks like they lost their trainer at the supermarket. It is the epitome of bird-brained. Maybe that's why its pose is so dumb too. Wait! No. Cormorants do this strange T-pose stance too. After all, they are expert divers, diving down 150 feet to catch fish. And afterwards, they hold their wings up to dry quicker. But also, during said dive, they can locate a larger fish for their next meal while catching smaller fish along the way. But here's where things get interesting. Rather than just consuming the big fish immediately after they catch it, they'll resurface first and decide if they can physically eat their catch. Spoiler alert, they almost always can. They defy all laws of what should be allowed by nature and swallow the entire thing whole, leading to some insane photos that Honestly, it looks just like Cramorant's gulping and gorging forms. This behavior is so iconic to the animals that the European shag's Latin name, Gulosus Aristotelitis, directly translate to Aristotle's glutton. The Aristotle part isn't important, the guy that named him just really liked Aristotle, but the glutton part is. Cormorants are excessive greedy eaters, eating as much as 50 to 60% of their body weight a day. How do they even fly? And humanity, of course, took advantage of this behavior to benefit themselves. Dating back to before the 9th century, cormorant fishing became a popular hunting technique in parts of China and Japan, and the practice even made it to parts of Europe for a brief time in the 1600s, including in the UK. The technique itself is pretty simple. A loose snare is tied around the bird's neck, acting as both a leash to retrieve the catch and a way to prevent the animal from swallowing larger fish to be harvested. Once a fish had been successfully captured and returned to shore, the animal would be ordered to spit the creature out into a net and then repeat the process over and over again. A single cormorant could bring about two pounds of fish per day to the fisherman. Not bad for someone who has no concept of money. But oh, don't you worry, these cormorant were not slaves. They still got paid. You see, a nifty thing about cormorants is that they're able to still count to the number seven. They keep a mental note of how many fish they've captured. And if they're not allowed to eat every seventh fish they catch, they will stop working altogether. They know their rights, and they won't operate under these exploitive conditions. Unionize, people! Unionize or die for your corporate overlord! But how about spitting up fish as an attack? Like Cramorant? Well, Cormorants can use their food as a weapon too. Well, I guess more like a tool. We're talking about Cormorant vomit now. It works more like a shield than a sword, but they'll release their last meal when they feel threatened for two reasons. One, to lose some weight, making flying away a bit easier in a pinch. And two, it has the potential to act as a distraction. Suddenly, the predator might be more interested in what it last ate. Or they might just freeze out of complete shock of what they just witnessed. But there is another waterfowl that uses its vomit as an attack. The northern fulmar also produces an orange, oily substance from stomach acid that it uses to launch at predators. It's an incredibly sticky adhesive, so if a bird of prey were chasing it and it gets the vomit on it, well, it can't really fly anymore, so it plummets. Perhaps this oil is the reason shiny cramorant is orange, as there aren't very many orange waterfowl out there, but it could also be a reference to this big news story out of England during Sword and Shield's development. This poor seagull got itself completely covered in curry. Uh, and since curry is a major thing in Galar too, especially as Pokemon food, and cramorant is a glutton, I'd say it's very possible as an inspirational source. But regardless, mixing the Fulmar and cormorant's defensive vomiting style gives us a good explanation for the gulp missile ability. But here's the thing, this isn't a mess of chum or some oil cramorant is spitting. This is a Pokemon. Aerocuda, to be exact. 
Now, before getting to them, I do want to talk about Cramorant's gorging form very briefly. Sometimes, rather than capturing an Aracuda, Cramorant will surface with a Pikachu in its throat. Gulp Missile still works the same way if it has an Aracuda or a Pikachu, where if Cramorant gets hit with an attack, it will launch a counterattack, quite literally, do some additional damage. But with Pikachu, it'll also add a paralysis effect. Now, I did mention that sometimes cormorants will eat things other than fish, but rodents aren't usually on the menu. Cormorants are opportunistic feeders, meaning that they'll eat whatever they can get their hands or feathers on, but they never go out of their way to get land dwellers. So as you might expect, Pikachu's just here because Pokemon wanted to add their mascot to this extremely unique ability. Or even just for this one scene in the anime. Cormorant should definitely try to stick with smaller fish. <laughs> okay, maybe not. Most often, Cramorant is seen with an Aracuda in its gullet. So what is that? Aracuda is a pure water type Pokemon, first introduced in the Galar region. Its name is the combination of the words Aero and Barracuda, which is pretty straightforward here. Though, it is worth mentioning that the Aero part of its name could refer to the Arowana, a species of Amazonian freshwater fish. Though, this is a reference in name only. The Barracuda is a different story. This Pokemon takes a lot from Barracuda. There are about 20 species of them worldwide, and Aracuda is an amalgamation of many of them. For starters, Aracuda adopts the general Barracuda body formula, including the amount of dorsal fins, pelvic fins, and most notably, their teeth and skull. You see, these animals are famous for their insane underbites, and there it is, in all of its pointy glory. And its jaw also closely resembles the pointed tip of a throwing dart, which were invented in the UK, by the way. And the first part of its Japanese name, Sashi Kamasu, translates to pricking, Ow. which is basically just another name for a small stab. The rest of its body resembles other parts of the dart as well, from the barrel to the shaft. And it even goes so far as to actually turn the tail fins into a proper flight, the part that makes darts fly really, really straight. To get even more specific, they resemble bellows style fins, which are really popular on throwing darts for beginners. The decreased wingspan and extended wing tips create a fair trade-off between ease of throwing and flight path. And backwards arrows on the body? Well, that's, that's just the guinea and barracuda's nearly identical pattern. And its general color scheme is inspired by the aptly named Red Barracuda. And sure, the body arrows are flipped, but since Cramorant fires the Pokémon butt first, it makes sense for them to point in the direction Aracuda would be launched. No, it doesn't! Why would it have evolved to have these guidelines that are detrimental to them? But while we're on Cramorant again, the two of these knuckleheads are soul-linked to a single comedic gimmick. And this design philosophy is certainly reflected in Aracuda's design. Slapping someone with a fish is a regular comic relief bit, as it's usually not related to the subject of the act and comes out of nowhere. It's a form of shock humor at its finest and has been around for over a century. And to just exemplify this whole comedy aspect of their design, their eyes are clearly meant to represent a pair of googly eyes. Which always make things a million times funnier. And look at that grin! He's just here for a good joke! Though the swirl could also resemble a handlebar mustache, a fairly popular style in Great Britain, and the general philosophy in comedy is that the curlier the mustache, the funnier the character. And there are other fish that have similar whiskers, like catfish, like the red-tailed catfish, which has a similar color scheme. So these could be a reference to that sort of fishy soul patch. Aracuda also keeps its pure water typing when it evolves into Barascuda. And holy moly. This is a crowded design. First of all, this thing should probably be water steel or even water poison type. Its sword Pokedex entry states, this Pokemon has a jaw that's as sharp as a spear and as strong as steel. Apparently, Barascuda's flesh is surprisingly tasty too. I'll be blunt. Eating the thing would probably kill you. Barracudas are a delicacy in some cultures around the world, like in West Africa, and generally most people do agree that they're delicious. They've been described as tasting a lot like tuna with a sweeter undertone. Uh, that said, barracudas accumulate a toxin when they eat other fish, and it's known as ciguatera, which is, to put simply, super bad for human life. Symptoms of ciguatera poisoning include nausea and tingling, and if taken in large enough quantities, it can be deadly. Due to this, it's generally advised to never eat a barracuda that is over three and a half feet in length. Barracuda's length? 
We have a lot of dead humans on our hands. Barracuda again takes many design elements from the Barracuda. Its aero body pattern has flipped to face forward, because it's fast and moves forward, and it now also has a line piercing through the center of each arrow, closely resembling the pattern found on the Great Barracuda. Also, it looks like fish bones, and I really like that. This species' size is pretty spot on for the Pokémon, and its primary color is usually a brown or bluish gray, which accounts really well for both of their regular colors and their shiny variations. Also, the googly eyes are back, but it looks much more sinister now that they've sunken into the Pokémon's eye sockets. And the frightening head appearance doesn't just stop at the eyes, its entire face now gruesomely appears, dried out, and crudely molded into the shape of a spearhead, appearing like a horror monster whose sole mission is to murder. It is not all fun and fishy games anymore. It's tired of being the punching bag and butt of all the jokes. The silly, curly smile now appears twisted and demented in this new context and resembles an even curlier and crazier mustache. A style regularly given to evil fictional characters like Professor Fate and Dick Dastardly, though these guys are usually played for laughs rather than actual sinister threats, which really just gives Barrascuta that needed cartoony angle since, you know, family friendly and all, and also slapping people with fish is really, really funny. We won't be getting the fish equivalent of the Joker anytime soon. While on the topic, Dick Dastardly was based on Perry Thomas, a famous British comedian from the 1900s. And really, it's just so crazy how much British culture they were able to just cram into these designs. I mean, being arrows themselves too, British longbowmen were considered some of the best in Europe in the Age of Kings. There is just one jarring exception for this line of Pokémon, though. Barracudas themselves aren't even the slightest bit British. In fact, only a single Barracuda has ever been captured in British waters. And that was in 2001, so it's not like their habitat is beginning to shift with the climate or anything. This report also happened off of the lizard in the Cornish coast literally the southernmost point possible within the island nation, so it barely even counts to begin with. And it's not like cormorants are known to dine on barracudas either. A 2016 study found that their diet mainly consists of wrasses, damselfish, and my personal favorite, the boops boops fish. None of which are even close relatives, as barracudas are the sole member of their family. The Sphiridae, Sphiridae, Sphiridae family. Uh, but sure, if you're going to go with an arrow design, you might as well pick a fish that actually looks like a dart, but what about this one? The pike fills pretty much the same ecological niche that barracudas do, being large, solitary stalkers at the top of the food chain that prefer to ambush their prey with their overwhelming speed and size using their massive serrated teeth. And I mean, look at them. It's like the same picture. The biggest difference, though, is that barracudas occupy warm, subtropical seas along the equator, while pike are exclusively freshwater fish that prefer colder climates overall. Now tell me, why would a saltwater addict be found only throughout Galar's lakes and rivers? Bodies of water generally associated with fresh water as opposed to salt water. Maybe there is something to this whole pike connection after all. They are fairly abundant throughout the UK too. And though they still are not the preferred food of cormorants, cormorants have been known to hunt these fish. But that's not to say that the Barracuda connection is completely out of place for the UK. During World War II, numerous vehicles were designed by British aircraft manufacturer Ferry Aviation to succeed the current model, the Ferry Swordfish. The first of these replacements was called the Ferry Barracuda, a carrier-borne torpedo plane designed specifically for speed. That's right, Dragapult isn't the only military jet look-alike introduced in the Galar region. Make way for Air Cram 1. And before you ask, cormorants were also referenced within Great Britain's military operations at this time. Another ferry aircraft was named after one of the previously mentioned cousins, the Gannet. Ferry Gannet airplanes operated in the 50s and originally were meant to serve similar purposes to the Barracuda. And there's also the HMS Cormorant II, a Royal Naval Air title given to 11 different types of military vehicles throughout history. But back to the Barracuda, the first iteration of this model failed tremendously, as available 
engines just could not keep up with the desired speeds. Later iterations did eventually install enhanced engines to make the craft faster, but never did meet expectations until the end of its production. Despite the aircraft's shortcomings, torpedoes fired from this plane remained a massive threat to anything in their way, as it should. The British created the self-propelled torpedo after all, and these weapons could regularly reach speeds of 100 plus knots. The same top speed as Barraskiuda. Coincidence? Absolutely not. The tail fins look pretty darn close to torpedo propellers, even rotating along a shaft to give this spinning effect seen in the Pokemon's idle animation. It is a self-propelled sentient murder spear, and that just sounds horrifying. <laughs> Let's hope Dexit does its thing in Scarlet and Violet. It's not like Spain has a booming Barracuda fishing industry or anything. Oh, 